now more about the most important event in the life of the Buddha, the unsurpassable supreme awakening, um, finding liberation from um, birth, aging and death and suffering, of finding the ultimate peace he was searching for. The awakening of the Buddha was not something that just mysteriously happened, but it was the result of his spiritual practice, his effort, and, and he developed his causes um, in terms of inner development and then wise attention, investigation. Because of these efforts, this practice, the result was the awakening. And The, the Bodhisattva went forth into homelessness and became a spiritual seeker at age 29. He first stayed with two spiritual teachers um, and who taught him to develop deep stages of samadhi, um, meditative attainments. However, the Bodhisattva noticed that um, he, he hadn't reached complete liberation so he noticed there was still something not completely at peace and um, so he left his teachers and continued his search for liberation on his own. And then he applied another common approach of spiritual practice which was common in India at that time. Also now to some extent ascetic practices. So also if you go to India now you can sometimes observe some of like spiritual practitioners doing some austere practices. <laughs> yeah so the idea behind is this idea behind it that you could gain some spiritual attainment and overcome defilements by harming the body. For example by eating extremely little or exposing yourself to harsh conditions. And then because of his diligence and determination, he tries that approach to the utmost severity for several years. But at the end, <coughs> he had to admit that his ascetic practices didn't lead him to some spiritual attainment. So he describes it to himself very nicely, his own words. He says, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, and whatever recluses and Brahmins at, at the present, experiencing painful and piercing feelings, that's the utmost. And um, but then he says, but by this practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman states, any distinction and knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. So the, the Bodhisattva had an experimental approach to his noble search. Um, and he, he would try a certain way of practice, a certain course of action, and then evaluate the results. And if the results didn't meet up with his expectations, then he would look for the cause or the reason in his own actions. So what can he do different? Yeah, so then ask himself, okay, is there some other way or what, what else might be a possibility um, to do differently, different kind of practice. And then he would come up with some possible solution and experiment with that. So the Bodhisattva didn't follow some um, say spiritual practice just because of tradition or because he believed in it, but yeah, he, he wanted to realize the truth, so he wanted to find out for himself and to um, to to do this investigation. 
yeah, and through this process of trial and error and careful observation, then he eventually succeeded. Yeah, and so after admitting to himself that this use of ascetic practices were actually not useful and didn't lead him to peace and nibbana, then he's asking himself, could there be another path to awakening? And, yeah, and he remembers an experience that he had when he was a child, and when his chitta, his heart or his mind spontaneously unified in samadhi. So he says he considered, I remember that when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied while I was sitting in, a co in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, entered upon and abided in the first jhana which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. And then, could that, could that be the path to awakening? That the memory of the happiness and peace of the first jhana brought two insights for the bodhisattva. The first one, there is not only happiness from pleasant sense contact, but there's also another form of happiness when the mind becomes free from sensuality and unwholesome states. And this happiness is actually something beneficial. It, it should be developed and one can use it to give up the happiness and clinging to unwholesome things. So the way to spiritual attainments is not by torturing the body, but um, by developing more and more refined non-central happiness by developing the, the heart or the mind. The second and more important insight was that samadhi, the unification of the heart or mind, jhana is the path to awakening, even though it is not yet awakening itself. And in, in one discourse in Dikanikaya 9, the Buddha says that samadhi is accompanied by a subtle, subtle perception of truth a subtle perception of truth, the noble truth of the cessation of dukkha. And yeah, the Buddha says that sometimes, sometimes he says that jhana is a relative stilling of sankhara, a relative stilling of formations, a relative experience of the noble truth of cessation. And already in the first jhana that the Buddha experienced as a child. For example, bodily unpleasant feelings cease completely because the body is pervaded by rapture and happiness from the spiritual practice. Or unwholesome mind states cease temporarily. Perception of sensuality then and the mind abandons its connection with the sense realm temporarily. And so this is why the Buddha calls jhana relative stilling of formations or cessation, nibbana. Because a large mass of dukkha, of suffering, conditioned phenomena and defilements is already ceased temporarily. And so, if you experience samadhi, um, 
inner peace from meditation, then it can become apparent that the stilling of all formations, um, abandoning of the, the clinging to the world, that's, that would be peaceful. And at least some intuition of that. Yeah, and then this is why the Bodhisattva has this intuition. Then he says, he is asking himself, um, could that be the path to awakening? And then following that memory, he, he says he came to the realization, this is the path to awakening. So as this intuition, this can lead in this direction, if you develop that. And then he he reflects, he, he thinks it's not easy to attain that happiness with a body that is so excessively emaciated. So he's obviously very, um, let's say, very thin. And um, so then he says he ate some solid food again, some boiled rice and bread. And at that time he had five other companions, five other ascetics who were attending on him and yeah they had they had the expectation that if if he achieves any higher spiritual state, then he will tell them. So they had the feeling he's the most diligent of them and the most impressive. And if he if he realizes any spiritual attainments then he will tell them and sort of instruct them. Already sort of having this intuition that uh, this might be the person to have some profound spiritual attainment. <coughs> but then, if he because he ate normally again, then the five other ascetics were disgusted and left him and thinking he's reverting to luxury and he's given up his striving. Yes, this is a short dhamma summary that also Venerable Asachi taught. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think in a way the more useful thing is to experience the stilling of formation formations by developing samadhi, developing the mind. Um, in the sense then the, the deeper the samadhi goes, the, the more profound will be the peace one experiences of the stilling of formations, first just relatively, and then possible also completely. Yeah, so the Buddha describes very graphic how emaciated his body was during his ascetic practices. He says he could touch his spine and he touched his belly, <laughs> things like that, and um, so that he probably needed at least a few months to sort of recover gradually. But if you're so sort of starved, then you have to recover sort of gradually. You can't just sort of immediately build up that again, um, this sort of body mass. And um, then also maybe to mention, even though the Bodhisattva gave up his ascetic practices, he was still living very simply and frugal. So he was eating only one meal a day, living in the forest, at the root of a tree, wearing rag robes. So it was still in comparison to a normal person actually very um very, very simple. It's also interesting, he describes then he also changes the place where he's living. Because it's a new location, so for different kind of practice. Um, during his ascetic practices, he stayed in an austere environment where he, he exposed himself to heat and cold. So he also describes this briefly. And yeah, 
Um, he says he would go into an awe-inspiring grove and dwell there. Um, it's a place where normally it would make a man's hair stand on end because it was just a, a, a very, uh, because of this location. And um, so he's during the cold nights, he would dwell at night in the open. So he would expose himself to the cold in the winter and at the day he would stay in the grove. And in the last months of the hot season, when it's hottest, he would dwell by day in the open. So it would be just completely in the sun and in the heat and the night in the grove. And so he, when he practiced his austere practices, he would stay in this yeah, place to, to expose himself to heat and cold. But now, after he's given up his ascetic practices, um, he's searching for a new place um, to continue his spiritual practice. And so he gives a little description as well. It's a di different atmosphere. <laughs> Still in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I wandered in stages through the Magadan country until eventually I arrived at Senaga Senanigama near Uruvela. There I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove with clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and nearby a village for arms. And then he sits down and thinks this is just right for someone who is intent on striving. So he's now going to a place which is more like a delightful, beautiful place in nature. Um, so a different setting for his practice. Yeah, as he's, he's regaining his body strength, and, but also developing his the inner qualities that lead to Samadhi and Jhana. So he had this memory of this experience of Jhana but then, obviously, he would have to practice to, chit to develop the chitta, the heart, um, in this direction again. And, um, and he, he describes in various discourses how he practiced then at that time. For example, in Majjhimanakai 19, he describes how he divides his thoughts into two categories. For example, he divides his thoughts into thoughts of sensuality, aversion and harming on the one side, and thoughts of renunciation, goodwill, and compassion on the other side. And then um, yeah, notice how these unwholesome thoughts would lead to his own affliction and to the affliction of others, practicing to abandon them. <coughs> and also he noticed how if he would think certain thoughts a lot, then his heart would get an inclination in this direction so in the sense of if he would think more thoughts of renunciation, then gradually his heart would incline more towards renunciation. Um, or more thoughts of compassion than, rather than cruelty, then his heart would gradually incline in this way. Yeah, then on a more subtle level, he notices 11 different imperfections of the mind that make him fall away from samadhi. And he he practices to abandon them. Yeah, so for example he notices that doubt has arisen in him, and because of that doubt, then his his samadhi, his sort of meditative peace, sort of fell away again, or he he become less, or um, inattention, or sloth and torpor, and then so he, he notices different things that make his samadhi weaker, and then gradually noticing that and making an effort to abandon it, these qualities.
his main meditation object that he uses is mindfulness of breathing. He says in a discourse in the Sanyutta Nikaya, monks, I myself, before my awakening, when I was still an unawakened bodhisattva, dwelt often in this meditative dwelling. So that was his one of the most regular meditation object that he practiced with, the mindfulness of breathing. Even after his awakening, he calls mindfulness of breathing the dwelling of the Tathagata. And sometimes there are some stories in the Vinaya that then he stays for three months on his own and says that afterwards he mostly practiced mindfulness of breathing. So he would still... Um, yeah, to develop spaces for jhana, he would still use that to attain meditative states, the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, so the bodhisattva probably experimented with mindfulness of breathing, how I can develop different qualities of the mind, is the breath. And he discovers this 16 different it's the steps of mindfulness of breathing that he taught later in the Anapanasati Sutta. How can he still bodily formations with the breath? How can he gladden the mind with the breath? And so on. Um. <coughs> yeah, and even though he has given up his austere practices, he still had a supreme determination and diligence in his striving for awakening. So it's that he gave up this austere practices doesn't mean that he sitting now um, I don't know, um, how say, um, more like laid back or something like that, but he's actually still very determined. He also describes it very nicely himself. He says, I've personally known, know, I've personally known two things, being discontent in regard to wholesome qualities. So in a sense, being discontent with the partial progress that he had, had achieved in his spiritual practice and unremitting striving. He says, I strove unremittingly, willingly let only my skin, sinews and bones remain and let the flesh and the blood dry up in my body. But I will not relax my energy as long as I have not attained what can be attained by human efforts, by human strength and human, human energy. And he says, it was by diligence it was by diligence that I achieved awakening. It was by diligence that I achieved the unsurpassable security from bondage. So, yeah, it's an example for the sort of powerful determination that he had. Um, So after practicing for that maybe maybe several months, not sure how the time span, how long it is, the Bodhisattva abandoned these seven, 11 different imperfections of his mind and he practiced um, to become proficient in using mindfulness of breathing to enter and dwell in the four jhanas. Um, and progressively subtle level of, of samadhi. And by developing these four jhanas, these four absorptions, the, bodhis bodhis the bodhisattva had reached a level of superhuman attainments. And that if, if someone dwells in them for extended periods of time, it has, an, it has a profound effect on the heart. It's like described in the suttas, the, the heart, the chitta, or the mind, it becomes pure, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, stable and imperturbable. And it also becomes capable to realize any higher knowledge to which the heart is directed. So usually we have this experience that, that, the, that our mind or our heart is rather maybe actually not doing what we want or rather maybe, um, yeah, something like that. And but then the heart can be directed or the mind can be directed and actually it goes there. Um, and 
results. Yeah, this inner development then culminates in the night of the awakening of the Buddha. The Buddha says in Diga Nikaya number 16 that on two occasions that the Tagata, the Buddha, looks especially bright and radiant. And the first one is the night when he realizes the unsurpassable supreme awakening. In the morning, um, before that, um, uh, a woman from a village close to where the Bodhisattva is living um, comes to make offerings to a tree deity. Her name is Sujata and she becomes the person who offers the Bodhisattva the last meal before his awakening. And, um, as she sees him sitting under the Bodhi tree, um, peaceful and radiant, um, she offers um, some food to him and she becomes the first person to take refuge in the Buddha, the first lady disciple of the Buddha. It's mentioned in the Aguttara Nikaya. <laughs> the Buddha would usually dwell under a tree as shelter. In this case, it's a fig tree species, later known as the Bodhi tree, under which he um, meditated. The Bodhi tree becomes one of the oldest and most important Buddhist symbols. The symbol for the Buddha's awakening, already long before Buddha's statues existed. If you read later stories about the night of the Buddha's awakening, one of the main events is the battle with Mara. Um, the the Pali word Mara is used in three different ways in the suttas. Um, the first one for defilements or unwholesome mind states that prevent a person from awakening. So that's the first meaning. The second meaning, sometimes the word Mara is used for that which is subject to death or decay. Sometimes, for example, the Buddha says, form is Mara, or feeling is Mara, or they are subject to Mara, in the sense that ultimately they, they are subject to death and decay, or they belong, in the sense they belong to Mara, to, to death. And the Buddha even says they're actually the manifestation of death and decay itself. And of course, these two meanings are connected because the defilements are the cause of birth and death. So there's actually a connection between these two meanings of the Pali word Mara. Yeah, in, the in a few discourses, Mara also appears as an external entity, a being that tries to prevent people from awakening or harassing people who have already realized it. Um, yeah, but if you read the actual discourses of the Buddha, um, you will see that the main battle with Mara in the sense of abandoning defilements took place already in the weeks and months before the awakening. The only battle scene recorded in the suttas, in the Sangutta Nikaya, takes place at a time when the Bodhisattva is very weak and almost dying from ascetic practices. Then the Buddha also says that someone who has developed jhana is temporarily inaccessible to Mara. So at the night of awakening, no armies of defilements and no armies of demons were sort of harassing the, the Buddha, but his heart was already very pure and serene and clear, and it had developed the strength and the power 
to uproot and destroy even the most subtle defilements. So some subtle defilements were there still, but um, certainly not like as a how to say um a very very involved battle. <laughs> The Buddha compares the mind that has developed the Vajranas with a large water reservoir, like a lake with a dam. And then wherever you open the dam, the water will shoot out. So just like um, there's this sort of power and then the f when, you, when you open it, then it just gets sort of unleashed. <laughs> and um, yeah, so at the night of awakening, the Buddha has developed his heart um, so far that we only had to direct the heart in the right way to realize these various kinds of um, higher knowledges and psychic powers that can be realized and and to abandon the most subtle roots of defilements. So it was already, the chitta at that point was already very highly developed um, from the weeks and months before. In the beginning I said that the awakening is the most important event in the life of the Buddha and because of that the Buddha talked about his awakening from various angles. So he gives different explanations or different perspectives of what his awakening um, entailed or what he realized by his awakening, how he can describe it, in, he described it in various different ways to yeah, give different perspectives. On the one hand, the practice that led to awakening. On the other hand, also the awakening itself and, and what he realized by it. And so what I say here is just the most common description that the Buddha gives, also the best narrative in a, in a way. <laughs> um, so yeah, one could also give some other perspectives on it as well. <coughs> Yeah, in the hours of the afternoon, before the night of, of his awakening, the Buddha continues to dwell in the four jhanas based on Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. And in the months before, he had already become very skilled in entering and dwelling in the four jhanas. And so he describes it himself like this. Tireless, tireless energy was aroused in me. Unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind concentrated and unified. Secluded from sense, sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, is self-confidence and singleness of mind is out applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of concentration is the fading away as well of rapture I abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware still feeling pleasure with the body I entered upon and abided in the third jhana on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who, is, who has equanimity and is mindful with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure in purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. And then he directs his purified and minds to different higher knowledges that can be realized 
and in the first watch of the night, as the bright full moon is rising over Bodhgaya um, from approximately 6 to 10 pm in the evening, he directs his mind to the recollection of previous rebirth. And so When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of recollecting of past lives. I recollected my manifold past lives. One birth, two birth, three birth, four birth, five birth. 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, 100 births, 100,000 births, 100,000 many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. I had such a name, such was my clan, such was my appearance, such was my nutriment. Such was my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared elsewhere, and there too there had such a name and such a clan and so on. And thus with their aspects and particulars I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who is diligent, ardent, and resolute. Yeah, so if you think about it, it's amazing what your mind is capable of. And if you would develop it, you could remember billions of years in just one hour. And this is an sort of interesting how to say, um, thing to think about, what kind of is actually the mind capable of. And so it's a powerful example. <laughs> In the second watch of the night, he directs his mind to the knowledge of passing away and reappearing of being. So this is <coughs> developed and um, pure, bright mind, he um, realizes the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings, how they get reborn according to their karma. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass on according to their actions, to their karma. These were the beings who are bad conducted in body, speech and mind, reviler of noble ones, have wrong views and acted based on their wrong views. On the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in states of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, in hell. But those were the beings who were well conducted in body, speech and mind, not reviler of noble ones, had right view and acted based on the right view. On the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye, which surpasses, which is purified and surpasses the human, as I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and I understood how beings pass on according to their actions. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the middle watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. Yeah. So how are the first two knowledges that I mentioned just before about previous lives and how beings are reborn according to their karma connected with the third knowledge about the four noble truth? 
and are there so just extras and not really, really necessary or is there some connection how that's developed in the in the Buddha um, yeah I would say the first two knowledges about rebirth and what Kama gave the Buddha insight about Stukha about suffering on a truly cosmic scale and if you use them in the right way then they can lead to very strong disenchantment and dispassion so if you imagine you could actually see that the tears that you were shedding because all of all the relatives and friends who have died that they would be more than all the oceans on the planet earth and or if you if you imagine you could see that all the bones of the dead bodies that are left behind in a countless rebirth would make a mountain which would just cover the entire surface of the earth sort of stretching up out to the horizon with everything covered with bones and then each time you thought this is my name this is my clan i'm experiencing this pleasure and pain that then and again and again and they were just clinging to a heap of decaying flesh and bones a self <laughs> and yeah well, if you imagine you could see that the blood that you shed in countless lifetimes when you were executed as criminal or killed as cow or sheep would also be more than the waters in all the oceans on the planet And the Buddha is later teaching this kind of similes um, himself. <laughs> so, um, but then, then at the end, he says, For such a long time, you have experienced suffering, anguish, and disaster, and filled the cemeteries. It is enough to become disenchanted with all formations, enough to become dispassionate towards them, enough to become liberated from them. Doesn't if you have additionally the ability to see how beings are reborn according to the Kama, you see that multiplied billionfold and all these beings passing away and reappearing. And so and one can obviously imagine then that the Buddha sees he directly knows this is this is Dukkha. This this sort of seeing that is a very powerful Anicca Sanya and Dukkha Sanya very powerful perception of impermanence and, and suffering and so seeing that yeah then um, leads then up to the knowledge of the vulnerable truth And so, yeah, the, this ability to remember previous lives and seeing how beings are reborn according to their karma also directed the mind to the cause of this whole mass of dukkha and back to the present. What is he doing now with his mind that keeps this process going? And for example, the Buddha says he saw that beings held wrong or right view did actions based on their views because of that they were reborn in higher or lower realms so basically noticing that pointed the buddha to the fact that was what causes the rebirth of beings it's actually in the mind that this their views and intentions is actually the cause for their rebirth so more or less this sort of cosmic perspective then because seeing also the cause of it, then he directed it back, directed himself back actually to his own mind. But the ultimately the, the cause of all this is can be found in the mind. And yeah, and so as a result, seeing this sort of like cosmic perspective of Dukkha, this obviously then this disenchantment arose and this passion and the heart was liberated, and liberated from form feeling perception and um, the five candles and 
So I think this is how the first two knowledges about remembering previous lives and seeing how our beings are reborn according to the karma led on to the realization of the Four Noble Truths, to awakening. Yeah, but seeing that this is actually Dukkha and then abandoning the cause of Dukkha and experiencing liberation, the cessation of Dukkha. Yeah, so the Buddha says then, because of because the Tathagata is released and detached and liberated from ten things, he dwells with a mind free from boundaries, because he is released, detached and liberated from, from form, from feeling, perception, volitional formations and consciousness, because he is released, detached and liberated from birth, aging, death and suffering and defilements. And there's with a mind free from boundaries, just like a blue, red or white lotus, although born in the water and grown up in the water, rises up above the water and stands unsoiled by the water. So in the same way, then the Buddha experienced this liberation, this freedom from, um, from this whole process. Yeah, by the realization of the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha had realized com complete unshakable peace in his heart now, in the present, but also abandoned the cause for future becoming and rebirth. So, so both. And yeah, additionally, he also had completely comprehended how conditioned phenomena, sankharas, originate and but then someone who had he became someone who had fully understood the all the entire cosmos and transcended it and this knowledge of the destruction of the taints the knowledge that he realized in the last watch of the night also meant that his liberation was final and irreversible and Yeah, so you can think, uh, maybe just the short pas passage, he says, and he directed the mind to the realization of the destruction of the taints. And um, he directly knew this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And he also directly knew, as it actually is, these are the taints, this is the origin of the taints. This is the cessation of the taints and the way leading to the cessation of the taints. So this third knowledge attained by, was attained by me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and two knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute. <coughs> you can think of the taints as a potential in your heart or mind and the Pali words, which is translated as taints here, Asava, it's related to the Pali word for flowing. And um, so sometimes this word is also translated as outflows or influxes by some translators. Mm. Yeah, so you can think of these asavas as a potential in your mind for defilements or disturbances to arise. And so, for example, the moment I'm sitting here, for example, not experiencing special sense desire or aversion, but there is still a potential in my mind that these defilements get triggered depending on what happens and what people say or do, or what I see. And 
yeah, so this is this potential in the mind it can still arise and um so yeah, you can maybe to give a simile you can think of this as was like a current in the water and so you can have water with a strong current like a river or you can have water in a lake which is very still doesn't move much mm. but as long as there's some water there's always the potential that there will be a current again and then if, if, if there's a storm at the lake then there's again some disturbance and so on but if the water is dried up then no current can occur anymore and so this potential for currents has disappeared then so similar someone who is completely liberated is often called keen asava so these taints the asavas have dried up and so no potential for any defilement or disturbance to flow out of the mind can occur anymore and if this causality of this origination has been understood completely then this is also irreversible so that in, in nature there are irreversible processes so for example you you burn a piece of wood then it turns into ashes it won't have suddenly jump back into the state of a firewood again and um so in the same way the buddha discovered by his awakening that there are also irreversible processes or realizations in the mind and yeah maybe some of you have also noticed this phenomena yourself for example maybe sometimes you noticed a certain thing triggers aversion very easily and then in, a, in another situation you're actually hardly disturbed by the same thing and so yeah, you can sort of observe if you observe the mind longer you train the mind longer you can notice does the mind get more inflammable by aversion or sense desire or, or less or maybe in some situations you can observe okay normally I'm actually not irritated by that but in other situations actually this potential is much stronger to get irritated and um, so yeah it's an interesting thing to observe maybe sometimes mm. and what do you do with your mind that actually this potential gets stronger or weaker but the, the fact that this potential can be stronger or weaker is already indicating maybe there's a way that it can be abandoned completely and yeah so the buddha realized the vulnerable truth and the knowledge of the destruction of the taints in the last watch of the night from about 2 to 6 a.m in the morning yeah and so as the sun was rising over the gaia the victorious buddha was sitting under the bodhi tree and had completed his noble search um, then being myself subject to birth having understood the danger in what is subject to birth i attained the unborn secure security from bondage nibbana being myself subject to aging having understood the danger in what is subject to aging i attained the unaging supreme security from bondage nibbana being myself subject to sickness to death seeking the deathless supreme security from bondage nibbana I attained the deathless supreme security from bondage nibbana. The knowledge and vision arose in me. My deliverance is unshakable. This is my last birth. Now there is no new becoming. The awakening of the Buddha was a historic event that happened at a real place under a real tree and if you like you can still go and visit the place where the Buddha 
realize the unsurpassable supreme awakening. Mm. Yeah, the place soon became to the place soon came to be known as Bodhgaya, and the Buddha designated it as pilgrimage site. King Asoka had a large sandstone platform erected about 2,300 years ago to mark the place where the Buddha realized awakening. And it was rediscovered by British archaeologists in the 19th century, called the Vajirasana, the diamond seed. And this and the great Bodhi tree are the center of the temple in Bodhgaya since 2,300 years. Bodhgaya has a unique atmosphere because of the diligence and supreme effort of the Bodhisattva and the supreme liberation that the Buddha realized there. And when the sun sets and it gets night in Bodhgaya, then the atmosphere becomes even more inspiring because then in the evening the Buddha enters the Vajranas and realized the three knowledges in the three watches of the night. So, yeah, very worthwhile to visit Bodhgaya if you have the opportunity. <laughs> After the night of his awakening, the Buddha remained seated under the Bodhi tree in meditation for another seven days, experiencing the peace and happiness of liberation. And then after the seven days have passed, he emerges from that samadhi and he directs wise attention to dependent origination in forward order, reverse order, and forward and reverse order during the three watches of the night. And then he speaks his first um, three inspired verses after awakening. Um, when things have become clear to the ardent meditating Brahmin, all doubts vanish, because he has seen things together with their causes. When things have become clear to the ardent melted in Brahmin, all doubts vanish, because he has experienced the cessation of conditions. When things have become clear to the ardent melted in Brahmin, he stands having destroyed Mara's armies, like the sun illuminating the sky. So that were the first inspired verses of the Buddha after his awakening. And at the time of the, his awakening, the Buddha was only 35 years old. And how will he reflect about things after his awakening? And how will he decide what to do with his life after he discovered the path to awakening? can hear more next week about the several weeks after the awakening the Buddha is spending time under the Bodhi tree and in different locations in um, Bodhgaya terms of yeah, how he reflects and about the events that happen after the Buddha's awakening <coughs> 